Good evening, dear colleagues. Uh, exactly 4 p.m. will start. We'll start by looking at the developmental policy of the past administration. Then we'll talk about official communication in service. And this will lead us to uh, how do you develop an ESCO memo? What is the importance of an ESCO memo? What are the general contents of an ESCO memo? So that's what we do between four to five. By five o'clock, Pastor Sojino will join us to take policy developments as it relates to professional officers. Thank you and you're all welcome. So before my yoga on the top join us, let's kickstart today's class. It's going to be an interactive forum. And basically the main idea of why policy development and official communication, it's important for us is that uh, for civil servants, most especially for most of us that are professionals, we share two roads. We are expected to do our professional work, go to the lab, go to the field, do treat, uh, treat wastewater, and also do administrative work. So as a scientific officer, you are not only a scientific officer, you are also an admin officer. So any information that has to do with administration of your office, administration of your agency, you are bound to know everything about it. So you can't say because I'm a scientific officer, anything that has to do with policy formulation, policy implementation, policy development, I, I will not you know. Immediately you are management staff starting from level 12. You, you are expected to familiarize yourself with uh, basic policy or, or, of the state government. And yesterday, in part of the discussion of uh, Mr. Sojinu, he has informed us about uh, Lagos state policy development, which has been core uh, developmental documents by which different administration in the states has always been working on. So, we will, we will look at how policy formulation in Lagos State started and how each of the administration of the past civilian government has come into, into play with it. And we now move into official communication. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lassisi Ade doing Office of Environmental Service. I want to be clear, can everybody hear me loud and clear? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, my sister. Thank you for joining us. Yes, sir. So at the end of this section, uh, each participant is supposed to familiarize ourselves with the policy trust of subsequent administration and the present administration, the teams plus. The last, uh, the first time of the administration, we had teams. For this, now we have teams plus. The second one is we'll talk about understanding communication in service. Communication in service. How do you communicate effectively in service? Thereafter, we'll now discuss the major part of an executive memo. So, like we all know, Lagos State was created May 27, 1967. That is something that each and every one of us has been familiar with. Uh, Ade Yoju, can somebody help me to call Falai? She's trying to call me. Okay. Somebody help me to call Falai. I will. Thank you. So since the creation of the states, uh, we've had nine military administrators and we've had six civilian uh, government. The first one, which is Alative, Alagi Latif, Jack on there, had its policy trusts on four key pillars, had its policy trust on four key pillars 
free education, free health service, integrated rural and community development, full and sustainable employment. So, Jack on the education, free health service, integrated rural development, these are part of his, his core administrative activities. And because of that, he was able to implement a lot of programs. Some of the programs that they did uh, during his administration, the state sector that uh, each and every one of us enjoying today was one of the landmark projects. Several housing estates that we call today Jack on the Estates. That time, people were going to school in the morning, and people were also going to school in the afternoon, and people are going to school in the evening. Afternoon school, evening school. But he was able to abolish afternoon and evening school by setting up what they call Jack on the School. We were able to set up Jack on the School. So he, he, he was able to let everybody see that you don't need huge amount of money for you to set up schools and most of us we we attended that school we, we just have blocks around and the the parts the, the larger part of, of the schools were were open and and with that they were able to create schools in different parts of, of, of the state following the upn uh, mantra free education for both primary and secondary school that time people have to pay to go to school, which makes uh, most people not being able to have access to education. So because of uh, that, they have many schools and also have uh, free education. Construction of Bagada and Ekorodu General Hospital, part of it. Also, it started healthcare centers. Yes, we may not have money to have big hospitals, but we can have Health care centers uh, that's also started during his administration. Establishment of the traditional medicine board, which some of the some of scientific officers are, are also there now. Uh, he, he, his administration established traditional medicine medicine board. Establishment on, of an asphalt plant, uh, which was in Ujudu then, he, because we cannot rely, he, he believed that the state government cannot rely on contractors alone to fix the roads. So Lagos has its own asphalt plant for routine maintenance. Up to today, the Lagos State Public Works Bureau has its own uh, asphalt plant. They also established the electricity board, construction of Adinyo Water Works, building of the Lagos State House of Assembly, building of uh, Lagos Television. We started Lagos Television and also Radio Lagos. And that time also, he established the State Traffic Management Authority, Masha. You know, everybody felt uh, last month is the first uh, traffic Masha that was started in Lagos State. No, it has started long. The, the first initiative was brought into the state during the administration of uh, Alaji Latif, uh, Jack Conde. So it was later recreating and uh, revived during the administration of uh, Bola Ahmed Tunubu. So these are key things, key things that were carried out during his own, his own administration. So we can be asked, the first executive governor of Lagos State, what are his policy trust? What, what are his policy trust? What are some of the things you think uh, happened during his administration? Free education, free health service, integrated rural and community development, full and sustainable employment. And these are some of the achievement during his administration. Thereafter, we have the second executive governor, which is Sam Michael Agbolade or Tiodola. So some of the trickiest question we they can put to us, name two executive governor of, of the state. So military are not executive. So you, some of us will quickly start mentioning, but we have to listen to the, the person asking the question before we so during the Sam Michael Agbolade Otedola was the second executive governor and he was the governor that introduced center of excellence the acronym that uh, uh, the, the the team name that all of us know Lagos for now started during his, his administration 
Center of Excellence. He implemented the Jubilee Mass Transit. And that time, we, we had a rail system working in Lagos then, toned by Lagos State government. So it, 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 people may feel it started during uh, uh, Governor Sahul administration. No, we had a Jubilee rate system in Lagos State during uh, the administration of Sir Michael Agbolade or Tedola. And he also started the Jubilee Mass Transit system. And he followed suits. He followed suit with what uh, Governor Jack Conde did by having Jubilee housing estates. By having Jubilee housing, housing estates. We, we, we have some in Ekpe, we have some in Etiosa, uh, we have in Agege. So he also initiated the centralized staff bus system. He, he, he had uh, uh, a system whereby they felt, okay, the, the transport system in, in, in Lagos was becoming cumbersome and staffs were coming late. So in order to uh, ensure that staffs gets to work easily, uh, they, they had a, a centralized staff bus system. Each agency, each ministry were having their own staff bus, mini bus to, to bring staffs to the sectarian. But he decided to have a centralized staff bus system and we are still enjoying it up to now. He completed the state uh, auditorium, the Ade Yemi Bureau Auditorium, where most of the state government functions now. Uh, he, he, he started. Uh, it was started before him, and he completed. He completed it. The third executive governor is the current president, Senator Bola Ahmed Tunumbu, who, who who was in, in power for eight years, and. The first two, I think the first two months or three months of his administration, they, they had a summit in Akodo. They, 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 after forming his cabinet, they, they had a summit in Akodo where they call Lagos Economic Advancement Program and came up with 10 point agenda. So the policy trust of Senator Bola Ahmed Tinubu when he was governor of Lagos State was based on 10 point agenda, was based on 10 point agenda. You know, we could not have clear direction of uh, Sir Michael Otedola uh, policy trust, but he came up with, he came up with what we call, he came up with what we call Lagos Center of Excellence. Everything we want to do was to make it excellence in, in, in Lagos State. But Governor, uh, the, the current president had what to call 10-point agenda. And his 10-point agenda was basically road, transportation, power and water supply, environment and physical planning, health, education, employment, food security, shelter, and revenue enhancement. So, during this administration, we had revenue enhancement, shelter, food, employment, education, health, environment and physical planning, water supply, transportation, and road. So uh, somebody said they can't hear a single thing. It's my hand or it's general. I think it should be your hand, though. I think everybody's. Can you hear me, please? Hello, guys. Hello, yes. police. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, Mojisala, please check your end. It will be from your own network. Thank you. So, if we are asked about uh, Senator Bola Ahmed Tinu when he was governor of Lagos State, everybody can clearly understand that one thing that we all credit him for is increasing the revenue generation of, of Lagos State, and which is one of the uh, 10 point agenda of, of his administration, revenue enhancement. He sees that, yes, a lot of leakages were uh, in Lagos State revenue, and we have this population. Let's take the advantage of, of this population and increase our revenue, and which he, he surely did. In, in, in terms of environment, one of the key things he also does was, uh, that was when we had Kai. That was when we had Kai, launching of Kai. PSP 
the, the pilot PSP program started before his administration, but immediately it came in, uh, it, it, it increased. We had, that time it was only piloted in two local government, but it was, it was statewide, and we are still enjoying it. So okay. Let, let's look some of, let's look some of his achievements. High investment in education, many roads, uh, or a good road, you can a better road. And uh, these are part of the thing done in his administration. Sorry, I think it's network from my hand. So huge investment in education, creation of the LCDA, he, he initiated, he initiated the bus rapid uh, system, which everybody now call the, the, the BRT, construction of Millennium School. We have the one in uh, uh, Ojuju, Millennium Estates. The Ingberti Summit also started during his, his administration. He also initiated the Lagos Mega City projects, which we we all have around. Establishment of, of, of LASMA. So, like I said, uh, uh, Governor Jack Conde started the road marshal then, but later, when the military was fused out, but Governor uh, uh, the present uh, president uh, initiated last month. Uh, we have last month up to up to now. One of these is the key ed program that we all familiar doing in this administration is what to call Jigibola. Jigibola that everybody know. And apart from that, we we also have up, uh, Ikeja General Hospital was upgraded to a, a teaching hospital, which is now known uh, as Lassus. So he also introduced. Uh, the PSP to waste management program. I said we, we, the state was having it as a pilot, as a pilot program. Then, but later it it make it wide in the whole state. One of the major achievements to to most of us then was the recruitment of, of the millennium staff, which which I I am and most of us are we we are proud of that. We we, we got employed in, into the state civil service, and that elevate Lagos State. Uh, generally, uh, and that's why nearly every state wants to come into Lagos and understudy Lagos because he had the bold step of recruiting over 2,000 uh, civil servants, fresh graduates from the university, just to join the, the, the civil service. No state has ever done it before in Nigeria, and now Lagos State is 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 benefiting from from that big uh, steps the, the president made then. And now you can see all, all other states coming to Lagos to understudy to understudy the, the state. So after that, it was followed by uh, Mr. Babatude Rajifashola SAN. So who took uh, over from uh, the president? And we all know the story he was the chief of staffs and. He followed his administration also adopted the 10 point agenda. And with the 10 point agenda, he said, okay, if I have the if I have the 10 point agenda, but you he, he won't really want to focus on some. So he focused on parts. He, 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 he said, yes, we are going to have 10 point agenda, but I will focus on power, agriculture, transportation, and housing. So he, he followed the his predecessor uh, plan of the 10 point agenda and introduce a new look. And he wanted just he just wanted to have the civil service to have the civil service nature. He wanted uh, the states to have the corporate identity. So each ministry, each agency had their vision, their mission, and we also we, we have a lot of, of things. And he, he, it was during his administration that we started the Lagos State Developmental Plan 2012 to 2025, where all activities, plans, programs of the states were docu documented. So that time he, he, he focused, apart from the 10 point agenda, he said, okay, we have a 10 point agenda, but I really want to focus on parts. So power, agriculture, transportation, and, and agriculture, and some of the key some of the key uh, thing he did then was rehabilitation of road. Uh, the Eco Atlantic City Surge plan started during uh, uh, the president administration, but 
the actual work started during uh, uh, Governor Farshola. Construction of roads, flyovers, and pedestrian bridges, uh, rural uh, transformation, electricity and water, uh, modernization of Abatio. So we, we are having uh, Oduero, just people slaughtering along the side of the road. But Ministry of Agri started uh, having uh, uh, large, whereby private sector comes into having uh, their own abatio and, and, and sort of slab. It built and commissioned 15 waterworks. It, it, it was massive. Then we had waterworks in different parts of, of the state during uh, Governor Fashola's uh, administration. Also, like I said, he, he said he wanted to focus on parts. We had five power plants during his administration. Alausa Power Plant, Marina Power Plant, Ikeja Power Plant, Lekki Power Plant. Believing that, yes, I really want to. Uh, and all these power plants serve some government institutions. Some government institutions. Let's take this government institution out of the national grid and, and see. So that was part of. And he also did uh, housing estates. We had a lot of housing estates that was constructed during his, his administration. And he also initiated and um, started the Security Trust Fund, having the idea that government alone cannot fund security. And they launched the Security Trust Fund where companies like I, I can recollect them, MTN, MTN, uh, Airtel, donating cars and huge amount of money to the to the state government. One big one big uh, effort during the administration of Governor Fashola, we all familiar with is the urban greening and climate change. It was during Governor Fashola administration that Lagos State took the bold step in urban greening. We, we, we see most of the loops, most of the loops and most of this uh, area we were, see, we were seeing now were actually illegal dump sites. Why illegal dump sites, Ojota, Ojota, where illegal dump sites were places where area boys joins together. The states during this administration, we we upgraded those places and we had a lot of parks. We had a lot of parks. Urban greening was one of the key uh, activities during Governor Fashola. And that time also we we did we started the climate change summit and the, the climate change. Conference. So we had a lot of programs. So as a staff minister of environment during this administration, we had urban greening, we had climate change, uh, we have others. So Thereafter, the fifth executive governor, uh, Mr. Kiumi uh, Dakwambode, uh, who, who, who came in after Governor Fashola, is the fifth executive governor. His own policy trust was, he, he also followed suit with uh, the, the uh, which is, I mean, who had parts. So he said his own is the parts. The parts. The parts. C for transportation, H for housing, E for education, P for fiscal planning, agriculture, revenue generation, and tourism. The parts. So during his administration, we, we had his policy trust was the parts. His parts with the citizen, with, with, with negotiations and transportation, housing, education, fiscal planning, agriculture, revenue generation, and tourism. And if we can all recollect, during this administration was when Lagos State started uh, uh, Fiesta. That's when Lagos State started Fiesta during Governor uh, Ambo Day. So we had Fiestas, we had cinemas uh, in different parts of, of the state, and we were celebrating uh, uh, December with, with fun. That time, most people, most people traveled to their states during December, we were unable to even, some have to stay in Lagos because it, it, it was fun during, during this. So some of his key achievement then was the safety arena. So it, it, the, the idea of the safety arena is, okay, let's have in different corners of the state whereby we can have all agency that's concerned safety. LASMA, CHI, Neighborhood Watch, uh, safety commission. So if and if there's an emergency, it's easy to coordinate from, from there. And I can also recollect that during Governor Fashola, we started the command center. Lagos State had the command center during Governor Fashola. 
we had we, we had a command center and we had the launch of uh 767 and 112 we had, we had it so when citizens call the command center and they can be dispatched and most of the dispatch starts from alausa and he said no if there's an emergency in Ekbe, would they leave all the way from Alausa to Ekbe? If there's an emergency in Oshodi, would they leave because of the nature of traffic in, in the state? So we started building safety arena at different corner of, of, of the states. So we also constructed 300 roads, commenced the construction of 10 lane Oshodi airport, and we 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 all know uh, Abuli Ekba flyover, Aja flyover. The, the, these are one of the key. Uh, success story of, of Governor Ambody. He, he established uh, some new fire stations. And with Lagos State partner with uh, Kirby State, and we have uh, Lake Rice then. We had, we, we, we had Lake Rice and we still, we still have it now. So th th these, are, these are some of the major uh, achievements of Governor. So one of the key things he also does was we, we started giving grants to, to CDA. We know because we know that community development also contributes one way or the other. Some CDAs will do road on their own. Some CDA will do power projects. And the state government started giving grants to CDA. Uh, one of the iconic structure that we all know today about Lagos, we some of us that grew up in Lagos knew how Oshodi used to be. During uh, Governor Fachola, we cleared Oshodi and Governor Ambode revamped the place and we had Osho Determiner. And anybody taking picture of Lagos today, you, you know that the, the structure in Osho is something we, we, we can all be proud uh, about. He, he also started the Employment Trust Fund, where Lagos State give grants to Lagos State give grants to uh, the indigenous and people business to, to support business. So, so that's part of after him. Come the sixth executive governor, who is presently the the the, the chief executive, his own is Mr. Uh, Mr. Governor, Mr. Selebu, that most of us call call him. So his own strategic uh, point is the team's agenda. It started with the team's agenda. And I, I will encourage each and every one of us to have. The team's agenda as part of the key things we are going to have at the back of our mind. These questions from the team's agenda are part of the team. We, we some of us who are uh, going to the director, Keda, these are things they, they, they will ask us. They, they may ask you uh, relate to the team's agenda, how it affects your work, or how your work or your department is contributing to the team's agenda. They, they may ask you, what is, what, what is teams for? What is the team's agenda for? How do you relate it to, how can you relate it to your work? So teams means traffic management and transportation, health and environment, education and technology, making Lagos State a 21st century economy, entertainment and tourism, as well as security and governance. That is the full meaning of teams. This is the first uh, policy trust uh, agenda of Mr. Governor in his first term. And it is expected that every public officer, every public officer in Lagos State must be able to know the team's agenda. You must be able to relate the team's agenda to your present work, to your present schedule. Also, you should be able to convince anybody that asks you a question, how is your work contributing to achieve the team's agenda of Mr. Governor? So also, we should be able to relate the team's agenda to the SDG, Sustainable Development Goal, which every nation wants to achieve. So we have been able to look at the state, the, the team's agenda we have been able to look at the team's agenda and look at the sustainable development goal and see how Lagos fits into it, how Lagos tries to contribute into the sustainable development goal. So let's look at the first pillar, the first pillar under the team's agenda, 
not the, the second term, the first term. Traffic management and transportation contribute to uh, go uh, sustainable go, go nine, 10, 11, and 17. Because we don't have much time, I, I won't be able to go around uh, uh, explaining each, each one of it. Health and environment contribute to three, six, nine, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Education and technology contribute to what? 4, 9, 10, 11, 16, 17. So if they ask you, how, what do you think some of the projects, what do you think some of the initiatives under the team's agenda has created or has contributed to the SDG? I'll, look, I'll talk about education. La Two years ago, the state government did, uh, we, we, we had a pilot school where we use container to, to, to pilot a, a school. The school is self-sustaining. It has solar, it has uh, most, of, most of the board are magnetic board. The student don't have to use chalkboard. So you, you can see that we are using technology to improve what? Education. We are using technology to improve what? Education. M, making Lagos a 21st century city. We, 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 are re, we are redeveloping and redesigning the city to make the city resilient to climate change, to make the city resilient to crime. So that's why you see that the state government continuously uh, uh, give vehicles to tax force, to rapid response calls, to the police, because a safe city is a city that economy will grow. If a city is safe, People, business, commerce will grow. So making Lagos a 21st century city also contributes to no po uh, poverty reduction. If people can do business, if people can relate well, if commerce grow, there will be poverty reduction. There's zero hunger. So if there's poverty re reduction, there will be zero hunger. So and Lagos, we have gender e equality. The gender equality in, in Lagos, so nine to eight to, to nine to 11. Entertainment and tourism, everybody knows Lagos for that. Lagos for show. So if we are Lagos for show, we don't want to just be a Lagos for show alone. Every, every major event that has to do with entertainment, we want to host it in Lagos. When you host, uh, people often ask, why do city, why do city rush to host the World Cup? Why do city rush to host the Olympic? Yes, because if you host the World Cup, if you host the Olympic, it's a form of tourist attraction. Business will grow, investment will grow, development will grow. So, and that's what Lagos also uh, in the team's agenda, entertainment and tourism. We want to entertain people. And when we entertain people, we know people will come in. Tourist attraction will, will be. And if tourist attraction wants to be, you, you want to clean your city. You want to make your city better. So also, under entertainment and tourism, it contributes to 1, the 1, 3, 8, 16, 9, 11, and 17. The last one, security and governance. Like I've said it, you can see some of the activities, some of the programs, some of the initiative of Mr. Governor buying vehicles, buying vehicles, supplying vehicles to the security agency, paying their paying uh, insurance if we lost any of the uh, of the police officer, prompt payment to their wives, prompt payment to, to their children, to encourage the living ones that yes, the government will not leave you. So security and governance. If we have, if a state is fully secured, I, I heard in one of the press release, I heard in one of the press release, was it last year when the commissioner of police came out and said Lagos has no witness uh, robbery as we, we, we used to be uh, while we are growing up. I know that we know what Shinorambo did in Lagos. We know what Shinorambo did in Lagos. We have not had uh, a bank robbery in Lagos in, in, in the last two years. We have not had major bank robbery in, in Lagos in the last two years. And we all know what really happened. I, I, I can recollect that was one that, that I, I had, the, uh, I was fortunate to, to why would I would I say fortunate? Because I, immediately I left the bank in VGC was when they came to rob 
the, 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 the first bank in VGC, which we were just hearing uh, guns. So Lagos has not witnessed that in a in, in few years because we support the police. That's why we don't have a state police. The state government support the police by giving them necessary uh, buy guns, buy things for them, and also give them special allowance. So as, as a management staff, as a management staff, audio, please. Uh, hello, are you sure? Somebody is saying audio. Am I audible? Hello? Yes, yes. 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 Okay, okay. So please, uh, Mr. Asha, can you get your hand, please? Thank you. So as a management staff, you should be able to relate the team's agenda to your work. How your work, your department, your ministry is contributing to the team's agenda of Mr. Governor. And how also, we are also using the team's agenda to contribute to sustainable development goal. Uh, 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 so that is, that is one. So after the team's agenda, the second term of Mr. Governor, where we are now, he decided to add three other components to it. We call it Teams Plus. So the team's agenda is still there, but we now decided he decided to add three more to it, calling it Teams Plus. So the teams is still there, traffic management and transportation, health and environment, education and technology, making Lagos a 21st century economy, entertainment and tourism, security and governance. Now, he now decided to have social inclusion, gender equality, and youth development. Social inclusion, gender equality, and youth development. We all know what happened during the HSAS uh, issue in Lagos State, and we cannot jettison the young generation. We cannot just see the young generation. That is why youth development and social inclusion became one key thing that Mr. Governor decided to put in his team agenda. So anything we are doing in our agency, we are doing in the state now, what is the contribution of the youth in our policy development, in our plans, in our program? What is the social inclusion? There are different social strata in the state. How are we carrying them along in governance? So you now see that before the state government comes out with the budget, last year, we, we started the citizen dialogue for the budget uh, preparation around October, where the state government takes the budget preparation to the community. So we, we are not using the uh, top approach now. We are using the bottom approach. The state government will be constructing these are plans, what we have plans in, in, in the budget for Badagri Division. So we go to Badagri Division, the state government will call a stakeholder and everybody will make contribution. We are doing road from Yafin to Agbara. We are doing road from Badagri to Seme. How many houses? How is it going to affect people? How is it going to? So, so because of the social inclusion, how are we looking at the disabled? How are we looking at the aged people? How are we looking at, we looking at the vulnerable people? So that is the thing that has been added into uh, the team's agenda, making it the team's, uh, team's plus agenda. So youth development, like I said, youth development is key. Youth development is key. Uh, Nigerian population, 65% uh, of Nigerian population can, are, are categorized uh, are, are, as the youth bracket. And everybody know when, we, when you are young, you are restless, you want to explore, you, you, you want to do things fast. So let's channel their energy into better things. So if you want to channel their energy into better things, let's, let's have... Uh, them into governance. That's why we have youth parliament now. There's youth parliament. Uh, there's, we, we had the, the one day governor over the years. Now we are getting contribution from the youth. The government wants to do this. What, what, what's this? The, the percentage of grants, percentage of grants in programs now, we have special percentage for youth now because of uh, the last experience the state had. So the that's just it. Also, it's a document we each and every one of us have to go and read. It's a document, the Lagos State Developmental Plan is a document anybody that immediately you are in level 12 above, you need to get your hands on that document and read. 
you need to get your hands on that document and read because the, the, the framework for, for the development of the state up to 2050, it's already laid down, laid down there. The framework for development, for water, for agriculture, for road, for housing, for education is there. So that's where you have most of the most governor who come in and key their agenda into, into it. The, the presently, this, the, the, the agenda of Mr. Governor has uh, some goals and also have some key performance indicator that they used to measure ministries and agency. So what are, what are things that has been done by the, the past administration, by the present administration, and what are things he expects to, to do? So now, like I said, youth empowerment is one of the key things. So this is some of the promising in the uh, year 2024 uh, budget. Well, is, the government is going to build nine mini stadia again. We are going to have a film editing, acting, and scripts. We, they, there's a program by from we Lagos State Government uh, with Mohabdu now, where we train. You know, you know, content creation, content creation, film production is is one thing that is growing in the world. Uh, yeah. a, a YouTube person, a, a TikTok uh, person makes yeah. millions of naira. Bloggers makes million yeah. millions of naira. Content creator makes millions of naira. So why can't oh. we? Why can't we uh, encourage the youth, train them properly so that they can, so we, we now, we, Lagos State Government is training a lot of young people in that in that aspect. Uh, the Okwebi League Bridge is, is going on, probably it's going to uh, be commissioned before the end of, of this year. They, they, that's a project that has been on for over 20 years. The Massey Children's Hospital is 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 also one, one that is, that's been there. It, it, it's going to be finished today. A 500 bed mental health hospital, uh, Igbobi, which is the one by the federal government, is uh, it's less. We, we now have a lot of mental cases issues in in Nigeria. Uh, we have people who, who, who fall into depression. So, and there are human beings. Let's take care of them. So, the state government is going to have a 500 bed mental hospital. Lucky airport. Yes, uh, uh, people's. A lot of people ask, why do Lagos State Government wants to have uh, 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 another airport in, in Lekki? Yes, you want to have another airport in Lekki. If it's not even going to be a commercial, uh, commercial uh, uh, a passenger airport, it's going to, we are going to have a cargo airport. Lekki Free Trade Zone, in the next five years, is going to be the hotspot of manufacturing and business in Nigeria. So if we don't want traffic, if you don't want things, People want to move their products out of the free trade zone. So if we have a, an airport there, the, 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 there'll be commercial uh, activity. So uh, for people who are saying, why do we want to have an airport there, it, it, it's something. So also the, the food security. Yes, Lagos, we, we, we are not an agrarian state. We, we, we are not more into, into agriculture. That's what people think. But now Lagos State Government, we are investing uh, in agriculture uh, we're having food and logistic ops. You you go to my 12, you go to my 12 and you wonder the amount of food that gets, that will waste. Food waste is, is one of the major problem in, 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 in Nigeria and, and in Lagos. So if we have food waste, as a, as a good government, we should do something whereby, so we, we the state government is having a coal room, we are having a, 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 an agricultural hub whereby People can study our food and we will reduce uh, food wastage. We are also developing the, the, the motion uh, hub. People have been testifying. It is direct. The farmer comes, bring their products in fresh, and you go there and, and you, you buy. These are some of the key administration things that Mr. Governor is doing. This year, we, is going to, we are going to have the groundbreaking ceremony of the Fourth Mellon Bridge. We're going to have the grand ceremony of the Fort Milan Bridge, and you see, it is going to create over ten million, uh, ten thousand jobs. And apart from that, you you can move from Lekki to Kurudu within within an hour. So this is part of. So the second phase of the Blue Rain will move from Maitu to Okuku. It will be completed this year. In the next, but on the 29th, Mr. President will be in the country to 
to inaugurate the, the, the red line. So these are one of the these are the major uh, activities that has been lined up under the team's uh, agenda. So that is the first part of the that is the first part of uh, of the lecture. Uh, so all, all questions will come because I know Mr. Dr. Sorgino has joined us now. Let's quickly roll up the order so that we can take him after this. So all questions related, we'll take them together. So like I said, communication is one of the most important thing in public service. Communication is one of the most important thing in, in, in public service. And each officer must be, was familiarize itself with how we communicate in, in service. What form of communication do we have in service? And how do you relate uh, with this? So at the end of this lecture, we should be able to understand the forms of communication. Basically, this lecture is just to give us an overview of what an ESCO memo is. Most of us have been hearing ESCO memo. What do they do in ESCO? ESCO memo, ESCO memo. I've not seen an ESCO memo before. How do you write an ESCO memo? Is the only director, is the only PS that writes an ESCO memo? No, anybody can write an ESCO memo. Immediately you have the, 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 the templates. You have, the, the, it's, it's not just for you to put in your, your figures and data there. So communication in the civil service have two channels. We have written channels and we have oral channels. And people have always said, ah, oral channels. Yes, sometimes oral directives are liable in civil service. Oral directives are liable in civil service. If there's an announcement on the radio that all civil servants should resume to work on Sunday, you know, say, ah, because you, you are not, it's not given to you in letter, you will not go, you get a query. You get a query. Oral channels are a form of communication in the civil service. So let's look at the written channel. The written channels include memorandum, which most of us call a memo which most of us call memo. So memorandum is one of the form of the written channels where we communicate in the civil, civil service. A memorandum is a short statement, report or notes used daily in the civil service. The next one is minutes. We are all familiar with, with that. Minutes are views, opinion, advice, information or directive expressed in writing during the course of the day. Oh, call, please come up with a minute on this. Write a minute on this. Or oh, there's a brief, and they ask you to come up with, with the minutes. We are, there's also what we call reports. Reports are what most of us, are, most of us that are professionals are familiar with. Reports are official written account of any matter which are usually written after analysis or investigation have been concluded on the subject matter. So this is this one we are all familiar with it as as professional. Uh, there's a public complaint, there's an investigation, and we have to turn in the the, the, the reports. Or there is a panel of inquiry. Somebody committed an offense and they set up a, a committee. So we have to set up. A, uh, we have to come up with a report for the peers to to make judgment on it or for other senior officers to so there's report. There's also a press release. There's also a press release. These are form of communication in, in that these are form of written communication in, in, in service. A press release, this is a method used by a government or department to inform the public about the state of affairs or other urgent matter. Okay, uh, Ebola during the we let's say we have somebody enter into Lagos today. And it's suspected that the person has Ebola. And we heard that he lodged in one hotel and he's moving around. If we cannot trace the person and we want to reduce the scotch of Ebola, the governor can, we can issue a press release. They can issue a press release. They can issue a, 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 a press release to inform the public that there's somebody carrying, uh, going around and the person is likely to infect others. So a press release is usually the, the, the written for where you used to inform the public. There's a press conference. So there's a difference between a press release and a press conference. A press conference is when you call the press and the public officer, whether the commissioner, the governor, or a director or a GM of an agency, face the, face the press 
and give out information, whether the information is written or horror, and then the press ask, ask question. So that's, we have the press, we have the press conference. Another one is executive order. Executive order is also a form of uh, a written communication in, in service. Executive order, these are directive issues by the president or the governor directly or indirectly. It may be in the governor's, uh, the president has issued an executive order. It may not be the president that will say it. It may be a, a special advisor or the ministers, but an executive order is uh, One executive order that each and every one of us is familiar with is no more subsidy. The, the president was just talking and just gave an executive order, no more subsidy. Yes, it's, it's something that is oral, but he immediately he make, he, he, he mentioned the statement. The whole company, the whole country becomes into, into panic. It's an executive order. So all, he has said it. So the next thing is all his cabinet member, everybody around him, have to make sure that that thing works. So that, that's an, except, an example of an executive order. Or something is terrorizing the country, and the, the president said, okay, IG, I need this person captured within 24 hours. We need the, that's an executive order. It can either be issued by the president or the, the governor. GESET. GESET is also a, a form of official communication. These are official government publications aimed to inform the public about uh, government decision. Most of the appointments, most issues are often found in, in official gazettes. Also, letters. Letters are also a uh, form of communication in, in, in the service, whereby you, people write letters uh, to, to each other. The president can write a letter to the National Assembly or the, the Mr. Governor write to the civil servant or write to, to the public. Pamphlets is another form of written communication. Pamphlets are print, uh, printed publication. They are fast and they are cheap. So if government wants to communicate an issue, like example, the styrofoam ban, we just produce pamphlets uh, uh, and distribute it. It's, it's, it's to help us to communicate information. And books. And books. These are short reference books that contain information on particular subjects. The civil service handbook, uh, the... the uh, service order, all these are uh, form of written communication in service. Bulletin board, yeah, bulletin boards. So we, these are facing out now because we have WhatsApp, we have other social media that has been integrated into official communication in, in, in service. Usually we have bulletin boards whereby they will place information on the board. That time, if you want to have promotion exam, they will just place your sitting position they place your uh, exam number and everything on the board. Just say it's not a form of communication. Wait for them to come and write you your exam. You have to go to the board and get your number, get your sitting position. That's that's an, a form of uh, communication in, in, in service. Also, circulars. These are short written messages intended for wide circulation. Most of us have seen different circulars. This uh, our exam. They have to circularize it to us, our interview date. They will circularize it. So that's those are form of written communication in, in service. Newsletter. Yeah, newsletter. Newsletter usually contain information that are of interest to a particular group in, in, in service. Newsletter for for financial officer, newsletter for engineers, newsletter for, for this. So the, the, that that's uh the form of written communication. Oral communication, oral channels, meetings. Seminars, telephone discussions, these are oral channels. So information may be the, the, the PS may come to a meeting and roll out a directives. It's a, it's, it's, it's a form of communication. You don't say because it, it's not written to you or you don't have it in, in file. You, you we have to you go for seminars, you go for things, information are passed there, it is accepted in, in the civil service. Telephone discussions. We can also be given official directive via telephone discussions from our principals, from, from, from people above us. It's, it's an official form of, of communication. Now, social media has also been added into it. Social media has also been added into it. Now we have WhatsApp group, an official communication uh, 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 sent on WhatsApp group. You, you have to take it. 
Twitter, Instagram handles, people can uh, civil server can be communicated to via the via any of the social media handle. It is now accepted as a form of communication in the civil service. So now let's look at memorandum, which we all call memo. Memorandum, which we all call memo. So there are different types of memo that we have. Internal memo, please come up with a memo on this subject, on this. But today, the general view of the memo I'm discussing is to focus on the executive memo, executive memo, which we call ESCO memo. So what is a memo? What is a memo or what is memorandum? So memo is derived from, memorandum is derived from a Latin word, memory. I'm not a Latin, so I'm an Ijebu man. If I don't call it right, don't blame me. Which means to remember or to bring to, to mind. That is what memorandum is all about. The Chamber's 20th century dictionary defined memorandum as something to be remembered or to note to assist in the memory or summary of a state of a question. So basically, a memo is to bring up something that you can remember or you can refer to. That's what we call a, a memo. So memo are used both in public and private organization. It's not only in the civil service that you use memo. Memo are both, you can use it in public service and you can also use it in, 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 in private side. Means a note, a minute, as well as form of letters in a written document. That is what you call a memo. So why do you bring up a memo? Why do you bring up a memo? Normally, most memo in government are classified most memo in government are classified or specialized information. Most memo are classified or specialized information. But now you see uh, the president will give an approval or something will be sent to the president. The next thing you see, you see it on Twitter. You see it on, on, on social media. So most memo are not classified again because you see civil servant scanning or taking picture of, of official documents and put it on their phone. And why they put their phone down, people take it and, uh, and spread it. So the presentation of memo involved data, facts, idea that will help government on a particular subject. That is why you, you, you come up with a memo. And before you come up with a memo, there are some things your organization or you want to aim at, what is the motivating factor behind the memo? What is the current development or state of act on the issue of the interest? Let me, let me put one that is general to us, all of us now, ban on styrofoam, ban on styrofoam. If you want to come up with you, they ask you to come up with a memo on the need to ban styrofoam in Lagos State. What are the things you look out for before you write that memo? What are the things you look out for before you write that memo? It's a policy. Government wants to come up with a policy to ban styrofoam in Lagos State. And you are the officer that will come up with a memo. So before you come up with an ESCO memo, you must first come up with a submission. You must first come up with a submission. And before you come up with a submission, what are you going to do? You are going to get your information right. You are going to do analytical discussion of the problem and the issue at stake. What are the policy options? What are the recommendations before you say, okay, I will write the submission? Because when you write the submission to the PS, you want to put facts, you want to put figure, you want to put the state of affairs. This PS will consider it, send it to the commissioner. When the commissioner look at it, they send it to the governor. When the governor look at it and say, oh, this is good, the governor will now ask that ministry or agency or department to do what? To come up with an executive memo that will be presented before the executive council. So you can't see that. You can't just come up with an ESCO memo. No. You can't just come up with an ESCO memo. There will, there will have been a submission. There will have been, have been a report or issues that will have been addressed to Mr. Governor and you look at it, okay, uh, there's need for ESCO consideration. You now give an approval 
for you to come up with an ESCO memo. So when you come up with the ESCO memo, in conjunction with the cabinet office, your ministry or agency will be slated and you do the, uh, the memo presentation. So a sound research into the subject, the problem and situation at stake is something that you must consider when you are writing the submission. Because it is the key information in the submission that will help you to write the memo. If you don't have the information, you can't just go straight and start writing the memo. Data collection and analysis. The policy initiation and analysis as necessary input for decision making at government level. What is the decision? What is the policy initiation you want? What is the analysis behind it that you want the ESCO to ratify? So each ministry is everybody, whether Ministry of Energy, whether Ministry of Environment, whether Ministry of Physical Planning, as government, ministry are to come up with policies. So you initiate policy based on your activities. Example, proliferation of uh, building collapse. Building collapse has been one of the major issues we have in the, in the state. So fiscal planning may carry out a study or carry out and say, okay, one of the key issues why we are having uh, building collapse is lack of artisanal knowledge. Artisans don't have basic knowledge. So Lagos State Government wants to, we, we are coming up with a policy whereby we want to have a partnership with UK government, we want to have partnership with Republic of Benin. Why is it that it's Republic of Benin? All the bricklayers, the Tyler, the best people are coming from Republic of Benin. Let's go and look at their model and use it so that we reduce building collapse. If you want to build a house now, you want the house to be fine, to be straight. You have to go and look for a, a, a brick layer in the public government. You don't want to get anybody from, from Shaki again. While we are growing up, it is people from Shaki that we know that are normally the best builder in, in Southwest Nigeria. But why are the Shaki people not doing that again? Why have we decided to go to the public government? So you want to initiate that policy, but there must be something, there must be an objective. There must be an achievement to something you want to get at the end of the day before you write before you write the memo. So, what is an ESCO memo? Simply, ESCO memo, executive memo, executive memo. In terms of state government, it's called state executive council. In terms of the federal government, it's called federal executive council. So, a memo can be written in the state. It can also be written in the federal. Uh, government is the highest policy organ of government that comprises the governor, the deputy governor, and appointed commissioner and special advisor of cabinet level. Not all special advisor are cabinet rank. Some are just special advisor. So memo is a short form of memorandum. So what is the purpose of an ESCO memo? What is the purpose of an ESCO memo? Initiates you initiate an ESCO memo for a policy, whether you want to amend it or you want to implement it. So whether you want to in, initiate it to amend or to implement. Let's say, like I, I made mention, you come up with a memo for the ban of, on styrofoam. There has never been a ban on styrofoam. So if that's a uh, memo we initiate. You want to amend something. OK, uh, in Lagos State, everybody is using uh, septic tank. We are using septic tank. But you, we have found out that the state has gone beyond that. What uh, climate change is increasing the groundwater level and septic tank is not suitable for Lagos again. So we want we are we are putting up a memo to start using biodigester in Lagos. We are putting up a memo for streets to have uh, sewer treatment plant. So instead of one house having septic tank, we are we are coming up with a memo to encourage five buildings to come together and have a, a mini sewage treatment plan. That's, that's we, because we want to amend the way we store sewage in the state. Or you want to implement a policy. There's been a policy that we have always been hearing. Uh, hey, don't cross don't cross bridge in Lagos State. Don't cross bridge in Lagos State. We, we are just, but we don't, have, we don't have a real policy on what we want to do. So we can come up with, with a memo to the state executive council on Road crossing in Labour State, a policy, having a, a real policy document on action plans and, um, and program of how you should not cross uh, this thing. We can also use an ESCO memo to initiate legislation concerning the states. 
legislation concerning the state, environmental impact assessment, environmental audit, environmental people felt only environmental impact assessment is only for industries, it's only for projects that are large. However, there are some projects that are minimal, but they have serious environmental consequences. We are losing our wetland in Lagos at a very alarming rate. We are losing our wetland at a very alarming rate. We are losing our water body at a very alarming rate. People just reclaim. Yes, reclamation is good, but how do you reclaim? What are the environmental considerations we want to put? So we may come up with a, a law to enshrine environmental impact assessment. We can also initiate a, an ESCO memo to inform government about issue or set of issue in the states. Drug abuse, drug abuse, uh, out, uh, out of school children. So th these are things that an ESCO memo can, can. We can also use an ESCO memo to propose or recommend a course of action. While we are doing our work, while we are doing our work, taking water sample along lagoons in Lagos State, we found out that the BOD level, the organic components in, in, in the water body in Lagos State is becoming high. Uh, we found out that this organic is because people are uh, running their sewage directo, directly into the Lagos Lagoon, into all the water bodies in the state. It's a study that it's, it's because of the water quality monitoring that we are doing, and we find it, and we need to stop it. So we can, we can start, come up with a submission that the governor will ask us to come up with an ESCO uh, memo. So an ESCO memo originates from a submission made by an MDA. So whether a ministry or department of an agency to the government. So the, the government, you can't just write, say you stand up in your office and say, eh, I want to write an, uh, an ESCO memo. No, you must have come up with a submission. The submission will have gone to the Mr. Governor. Mr. Governor will have approved the submission, look at it and say, okay, no, I will not be the only one that will look at this, come up with an ESCO memo that, that for the consideration of, of the M, of the of the ESCO. So what is what does an ESCO typical ESCO memo typically contain? So when you look at an ESCO memo, what information do you expect to see in an ESCO memo? Ah, we've passed our time. So the first one is introduction. The first one is introduction. The second one is background or existing state of affairs. So like I, I also go back to the use of, uh, of styrofoam. So in the, in the introduction, don't think everybody knows about styrofoam. Don't think everybody knows about styrofoam. Yes, everybody knows what styrofoam is, but do they really know the main component, the main information surrounding it that would justify the ban? So in your introduction, you want to. The background, styrofoam, how does it come about? How do they use it? Yes, people use styrofoam, but the styrofoam that we are talking about is in, is in food packaging. We are not banning styrofoam use. They use styrofoam in chair making in FDZ. No, we are not after that. We are after styrofoam in food production, in food packaging, because we found out that, yes, the food package ultimately is one use. They throw it away. So what is the issue in controversy? Yes, styrofoam cause drainage blockage. It has been suspected as the uh, one of the uh, precursor, the, one of the components in need is one of the precursor for for cancer. So what is the nature of the proposal? What are we proposing? Pure band, reduction, uh, stop the selling. So your ESCO memo must be able. And what is the methodology you want to use? What is the methodology you want to use? You want to use two days for campaign, one month for face out, after that's enforcement. And if there are procurement method or cost implication, that will attach to that uh, memo, to that action, you need to put it. Then you need to put your prayer. We pray that the State Executive Council approve Ministry of Environment action for us to ban the use of styrofoam in food uh, preservation serving in, in the state because of this, 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 this. Then, the initial of the ESCO memo, it is uh, of the ESCO member. It is only the honorable commissioner. You can't say yes because you are the PS or you are the director that the department uh, write the submission. You are the one that is going to initiate it. No. And they don't write full name. Like uh, Tokumba Wahab is the uh, honorable commissioner. So it is just in, in its initial. 
that, that will put it. The designation of the presenter, you know, sometimes, yes, it may not be the honorable commissioner that will present the ESCO memo, maybe the most senior no. or the peers. Hey, and, and the initial of the, yeah. of the, what is so, shaking in him? The only I know that is stopping also. The cover page of the ESCO memo, it's normally like this the document is the property of Lagos State. So, like we said, ESCO memo are always secret. Don't go and to say because you have advantage to see ESCO memo in the file, you scan it and you take it home and your family sees it and start putting it on, uh, on social media. It's a treasonable offense. You, you are leaking government uh, documents. So the documents, uh, it has a back cover, normally it has a code. The title of the memo, ban on styrofoam in Lagos State, is just, I just use this as example. Like I've said also, that's introduction, background. So basically that's that's what an ESCO memo is all about. Our time is, is far spent. Realizing that the executive council is for a crucial policy decision making. You should ensure that the ESCO memo has clarity. It express the uh, there's no ambiguity. Uh, no, you are, the information you put in paragraph one is conflicting with the paragraph two. And these are people that have limited time. You must and be factual. Don't put information that is not credible in ESCO memo because immediately the ESCO pass it and they find out that uh, the information you put there is something that's gross misconduct. You'll be charged because you are misleading the state. Be meticulous and take time to read the ESCO memo very well before you do what you 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 submit it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think we've we've tried for for today. If there's any question that I think I can take, we can. Yeah, the floor is open. Uh, Dr. Sajinu is waiting for us for the second lecture. So if you have any question or any observation, or if you have any other senior director that is available that I want to help to add, you know, I always have a guy at the top above me. So if any of my guy at the top is in the room to you help to make contribution, the floor is open. Thank you all. Yeah, we'll send, we'll send the slide immediately after the after the lecture, will, the slide will be available. So if there's no question by 5.10, Dr. Sajinu will come in for his own lecture. I think I, Mayoga, are you available, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, Oga, Mayoga at the top. Welcome, sir. Yeah. <laughs> we, who is your God? Which top? Which top is that? The first thing that I call our God the top is not even himself a God the top now. <laughs> Just to add to the ESCO memo stuff, that some time ago a circular was issued with respect to the font type you can use and the font size you can use in preparing an ESCO memo. If my memory is not failing me, I think it's Times New Roman, and I think the font size is 14. Just to add that to fantastic delivery you just made now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. I, I, yeah, I, I think I'll look for that. I'll look for that. Yes, it, it gives specification on it's giving you a discussion of the, the types of fronts you can use, the size and everything. So thank you. Um, that's all from me. Uh, Dr. Sajinu will continue with the class. Have a nice evening, ladies and gentlemen. God bless you. That's in place. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lazisi. That was a professorial delivery. And I think uh, you deserve a lot of uh, accolades for a job well done. Thank you, my guy at the top. 
I am trying. I'm trying to share my slide, and I think I should go to slideshow. Slideshow. Okay. Just let me know if you can see my slides. You can see it, sir, clearly, sir. Okay, thank you very much. It's very clear, sir. Very okay, clear. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to be talking on development and implementation of public policies. Uh, I spoke about it yesterday, but unfortunately, I couldn't present a sli uh, any slide. I have about 11 or so slides if I'm not mistaken, and I will speak to the slides as fast as I can um, so that we can all be done with this and rest and get ready for tomorrow's work. Like uh, Mr. Lassetti said, what one of our major responsibility as civil servants, particularly those of us who may find ourselves at the management level, KEDA, is to come up with public policies. That's our job. Our job is to come up with public policies if you are within the ministry. And if you find yourself in the agencies, of course, your key responsibility is to implement public policy. And so basically that's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, I tried to explain what a public policy is yesterday. And I said, it's just a course of action or, you know, guidelines or guiding principles that, you know, government has adopted to address some, you know, existing social problems. Government has adopted a set of actions that they intend to implement to be able to address some issues, some societal issues. And I gave an example, for instance, if we we are having um, the, the the issue of styrofoam that we have mentioned, it's one policy statement that government has made, and I explained that the fact that we are ha spending billions of naira year in year out just to clear drains, just to clear drains, and these drains are being silted with not just sand but with a lot of styrofoam and uh, single use plastics. And some people are smiling to the bank, producing styrofoam. Some people are smiling to the bank, distributing styrofoam. Some people are smiling to the bank, using styrofoams for food packaging and all the rest, while government is spending taxpayers' money to clear the mess. And so government cannot continue to do that. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any form of economic sense. And that is why the decision to ban styrofoam is just one step in a lot of steps that will still come. Single-use plastic will still go, but let's start with styrofoam first, because we must begin to now put our money where our mouth is. We must begin to put resources where there are more needed. We can use these billions of naira to do other things, to fund hospitals, to have drugs, to make sure that schools are well-funded and all the rest. So that is why government has to take the action that was taken. So these are, so that kind of action is a public policy. It is actually made to address public problems, social issues, societal issues. So that is what a public policy is all about. And you can have three major types of public policies. Number one, it could be regulatory. A public policy could be regulatory. You can be using it to regulate the actions of some people. For instance, you can say, okay, industries in Lagos, before you discharge your wastewater or your effluents into the Lagos environment, it must be treated to meet La Sepa standard for wastewater. That is a regulatory policy and you can enforce it. So any industry that violates that policy, of course, can, can face sanctions. So that is a regulatory policy. It is regulating the activities or actions of some individuals. Then you can have a restrictive policy, a policy that is restricting certain actions or certain people from carrying out certain actions. For instance, we said you can no longer ride or cadre motorbikes on certain streets in Lagos 
on bridges and certain roads in within certain local governments in Lagos State. That's a restrictive policy. Another restrictive policy you may have experienced is the one that we had during the COVID-19 pandemic, where government say. I think it's net network from his silence. Let's give him a little time. Sorry, to... I'm bad. I'm actually okay. using the network of my phone and some enemies of progress are calling me on my phone. So can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, sir. So let me reshare my slide. It's some enemies of progress. So. Okay. So you can have a facilitating policy, a policy that is meant to facilitate some actions. For instance, the Lagos State Plastic Waste Management Policy is a facilitating policy meant to facilitate efficient management of plastic waste in Lagos. That is a facilitating policy, helping us, you know, clearly stating actions that parties should take, individuals will expect to take to ensure you have efficient management of plastic waste in the state. Okay, so, um, Let's look at fundamentals of public policies, basic things that a policy, a public policy, you know, it will involve. The first one is problem identification. What exactly are the issues that we want to address? What is the problem we want to solve? Which societal problem are we trying to solve? That is the first step. So, in, so when you give this. When you take the example of the plastic waste management policy, the impact of plastic waste on our environment, we want to reduce it. So we, we want to see that plastic waste don't constitute a problem again in our environment. And so that is the problem we've identified. We identified the fact that plastic waste has become a major environmental issue. Apart from blocking our drainages, they have health implications because some of these plastics find their way into our water bodies. And of course, fishes and other aquatic organisms get to eat them up as microplastics. And then we will think that we have seen fresh fish. Ah, this is fresh tilapia from a pair. And then we go and buy it. This tilapia has eaten, has taken in so many microplastics and it's already in the, in the system, in the tissues. And then we eat it. Sometimes, we don't even boil, we don't even cook them very well. We say, oh, for or mofe, mofe, lo, for or. don't let it be too cooked. And then you are eating a four or uh, plastics into your system. And you are eating a four or carcinogenic materials into your system. So that is the way, <laughs> that is the challenge. So, so that's the problem we have found. And that was a problem we wanted to solve. So the next thing was to set out goals we want to achieve. What do we want to achieve with this policy? We want a 20% reduction between now and 2030. We want 50% reduction. We want plastic waste to be a thing of the past by 2050 and all the rest. So these, of course, are some of the goals we can set. And then, of course, the policy document will now have specific policy actions or policy statements. Mr. A must not do this again. Mr. B must begin to do this. So these are steps. These are what it basically are fundamentals of a public policy. So let's look at policy formulation processes or steps. Uh, the very first step is problem identification, which we have talked about. And then we do a need assessment what type of policy do we need? What actions do we need to take? And so we, when we have done with need assessment, we set the goal. So item number three is policy drafting. So that, that L is a typographical error. So item number three is the drafting stage. And this is very important. The policy drafting stage involves a few things. Number one, it involves a robust research on the subject matter. You need to do a lot of research, do a lot of study on the subject matter you are trying to address. You need to share what has happened in other clients, particularly similar environments like ours. 
how are they managing their plastic, for instance, in India? How are they must, uh, you know, managing their plastics in Ghana? And so you are looking at what other, you are looking at best practices in other parts of the world. And you're looking at what actions they took. And so you can even look at if there are existing plastic waste management policies anywhere else, you can look at it. You can review it and also look at what you can take out of it. Now, in the process of policy drafting, you also need to engage stakeholders. So stakeholders' engagement or consultation is very key. You need to engage people that are likely to be affected by the policy. You need to engage institutions. You need to engage MDAs that may have a role to play in the policy. You need to engage subject matter experts, people who, are, who have expertise in the subject matter that you are trying to, in the area that you are trying to draft a policy for. And then so that all these efforts now come up you know, culminate in you now having a draft policy. And then that draft policy must be ratified. Now, because this is a public policy, in the state level, it has to be taken to the ESCO. The ESCO need to look at it, and the ESCO need to ratify and sign off on it before you can disclose it. And so you have a ratification, policy ratification, and then disclosure. Because there is no, it does not make any sense having a policy that is not known to the public. It does not make any sense. So if there is a policy on a subject matter, it must be disclosed to the public so the public will know the position that government has taken on such a matter. And so public uh, policy ratification and disclosure is very key. Now, what, make up, what makes up a good public policy? How do I look at a, policy, a public policy and say this is good. Number one is effectiveness. Effectiveness. And, so, and, and that is why when you are reviewing a public policy, these are some of the things you look out for. Is it effective? Is the policy achieving the intended goals? Is it producing the desired outcomes? Let me ask you, is the ban on Okada riding in some parts of the state producing the expected goal, the intended goal? Is it producing the intended outcomes? The answer is yes. Data from hospitals and Ministry of Health is revealing that with the ban in some areas, casualty rate has reduced. The number of people who are losing their limbs and losing their hands has reduced as a result of ban on the use of motorbikes in some areas. And so that, these are some of the indicators to see whether the policy is effective. Over time, we will begin to see whether the ban on styrofoam is effective. By the time we begin to see, by the time we begin to see, you know, results, we begin to see what is happening with our drainage channels, can now be able to measure the effectiveness of that policy. Number two is cost effectiveness. If for every policy we need to look at, we need to match benefits with costs. What, are we, what do we stand to gain from this policy? Not just in monetary value, but in social economic value to the people. Are we preserving lives? Are we improving, improving the quality of life of people, of negotiations? Are people getting better services? Is their lifespan in, you know, increasing? So we look at the benefits vis-a-vis -vis the cost with respect to what we probably are losing for having that policy or what people will have lost for having that policy. And wherever you see the benefits outweighing the cost, that is a good policy because it is important for us to look at, to do cost-benefit analysis of our policies. Another yardstick is equity. Public policies must be fair and just. It must ensure that both benefits and bodies are distributed equally. So you must not have a policy that favors only the rich, and then it gives benefits to the rich and put the burden on the poor. That kind of policy is not 
an equitable policy and it's not a good public policy. We had a situation when you when you know we had the change we when we were trying to redesign the Naira. That was a major public policy. And we we're redesigning the Naira. And at that time we saw that even the rich, well, some class of rich men also were having were bearing the body. But some super class of rich men were having access to the money. They were having access to the money while people are practically dying to get the Naira. That is not an equitable policy. We saw on social media people spending, you know, these notes, these new notes, redesigned notes in its bundles. We were Nigerians are queuing and dying, practically dying, you know, waiting in the banks to be able to get these Naira notes. That policy is not a good public policy. It does not, it didn't spread the benefits and the burden, you know, equally. Another yardstick for measuring a good public policy is transparency. But the public policies must be developed, implemented, and evaluated in a transparent manner with clear information available to the public. We must not conceal information. We must make sure that the public have clear information. For instance, the ban on styrofoam, we must release to the members of the public from time to time what government is doing with respect to this ban, how much time they have, when will enforcement take place, where, you know, how will enforcement, you know, take place, how many more days they have, and all the rest. These are features of a good public policy, and it must be transparent. One of the basic, one of the major public policy we have in Nigeria that is a, a major issue is the policy on subsidy removal. As we speak today, as we speak today, and that person take care of his family or her family. As we speak today, not too many of us know how much we pay on, on subsidy. And there have been arguments about whether there is actually subsidy whether subsidy is a fraud and all the rest. We were told that subsidy has been removed, but we are also told now that subsidy is being paid underground. So that policy is shrouded in a lot of secrecy. There are no, there is no transparency at all. That is not a good public policy. Number four is adaptability. Public policies must be flexible to adapt to changing circumstances and new information. The world itself is dynamic. Life is not static. So if a, a policy may be fantastic yesterday and may not be fantastic today because of changing circumstances. So public policies must have the capacity to adapt to changing situation. Particularly policies on environmental management. I've said time and time again that environmental management is always evolving and dynamic. And so our policies must also, you know, evolve and be dynamic as the system is dynamic. There used to be a time when enforcement is the only language that we know in environmental management, where we have to bring out the stick. But the world is evolving from enforcement more to advocacy and education, where people, where you know, global practices are now looking at people now be doing voluntary compliance. And our policies must also begin to embrace what is involving. That is why public policies must be, must have adaptability. Public policy, a good public policy must involve inputs from stakeholders. Inputs from stakeholders. Public policies must not be the one that is just imposed on the people. The people who are likely to be affected by the public policy must make input into it. Citizens must be consulted. A subject matter experts must be consulted. You know, those who are likely to be affected must be consulted so that they can have input. And one of the benefits of stakeholders' engagement in policy formulation is that people, when people make input into it, they own the policy. They no longer see it as their thing. They see it as our thing. That is why engagement is important. And people can easily comply because they were part of the process for formulating the policy. 
And that is why a good public policy must have very sound stakeholder engagement process. Sustainability. Policies should promote long-time sustainability, taking into account environmental, and social, and economic you know, factors. Policies must look at sustainability. And that is it, it is important. A lot of people have a lot of people have you know either run bankrupt or gone out of business because of policy somersault. Yes, a lot of government policy somersault. Yes, Some businesses are affected yes, by policy, government policy somersault. Yes, government yes, says yes, this is possible yes, today. Yes, 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 government says this is no longer acceptable. Yes, yes, and people have invested money into that area, and then they have to they have to throw it out. Their investment goes into goes into the drain. But, then poli public policies should be based on evidence, facts and figures. Okay. It should be evidence based. We should be able to produce facts and figures. We must be right. able to do thorough analysis of the facts and the figures before we arrive at our policies. We don't just form policies based on what we think. It must be based on what we know, what we know of a fact. That is the true state of affairs. We can't continue to you know, have policies on assumptions or presumptions. Policies must be research based, they must be based on facts and figures. And then, lastly, policies must have low risk. Because there is no policy that does not have unintended effects. But we must ensure that the unintended impacts of those policies are low. In pharmacology, they will tell you that drugs, drugs have two effects. They have the main effects, the reason why you are using the drug, and they have side effects, which is not one of is not what you want, but it has side effects. The same way, sometimes police policy policies also have those two effects. The main part, the main benefits you want to achieve. That is one effect, the main effect. And then there are some unintended effects yeah. that may come as a result of public policy. For instance, ban of styrofoam. Some people are likely going to lose their business. That is not government intention, or it will happen. That is an unintended effect. Some people are likely going to lose their businesses. Those who distribute styrofoam may have to look for something else to do. That is not the intention of government, but that will happen. When we ban Okada, Okada riding, we did not intend that people should lose their source of livelihood, but some people lost their source of livelihood. Some families could not feed themselves for some time. It wasn't government's intention, but it has to happen. So for every public policy, there are unintended risks and impacts that come from it, but it must be low. So a good public policy must have very low unintended risk. Hey, hey, hey. That is, those are fundamentals of good public policy. Let me quickly jump to the major policy document I spoke about yesterday, for those who are around. I spoke about the Lagos State Development Plan 2052. It is a 30-year development plan. The document is a 30-year development plan for Lagos from 2022 to 2052. It has several, it's broken into several terms, what we call, you know, the, the low-hanging foods, the low-hanging foods that you can immediately achieve. That one is between 2022 and 2023. Those ones are things you can achieve immediately. They call them immediate terms. And then it has what we call the near term that run from 2023 to 2030. And these are the initiatives we are expected to be implementing now. And then you have the one that run from 2030 to 2052. And so it is a 30 year development plan. It has four major pillars and has 447 initiatives. It has four major pillars and 447 initiatives. Those initiatives are broken into two major areas, expenditure initiatives, initiatives that will involve the use of money. You have to spend money, spend money. 
And then there are revenue initiatives, initiatives that are likely going to bring revenue to government. So these are usually the, are, are the two major uh, uh, you know, ways you can categorize those uh, uh, initiatives. And then there are four major pillars, like I told you, of this development plan. Pillar number one is thriving economy. Lagos want to have a thriving economy where there will be a lot of jobs and investments that will continue to support the growth of the economy. Under this pillar, there are 162 initiatives. 162 initiatives. The second pillar is to have a human-centric city. A human-centric city, a city that supports its own people. So Lagos want to have a city, want to be able to provide enabling environment that will create opportunities for every Lagosian to be able to fulfill their dreams. You know, this pillar has 76 initiatives under it. And then the third initiative, the third pillar is modern infrastructure. The modern infrastructure pillar has 92 initiatives. Incidentally, that is the pillar under which environment falls. Just like environment falls under pillar H, in the Teams Plus agenda, under the LSDP 2050 uh, uh, plan, 52 plan, I mean, we fell under modern infrastructure. And I need to explain why we're under modern infrastructure. The built environment is on the environment. Everything you do, you build a house, you build a bridge, you are building an industry, it's on the environment. So the environment is the one that supports infrastructure. And there is no infrastructure development that will not going to, that is not going to have make impact on the environment. That is why the environment falls under the modern infrastructure, you know, pillar of this development plan. And the fourth uh, pillar is effective governance. Effective governance. Of course, Lagos is desirous of having a state where, you know. You government will provide an enabling environment for every Lagosian, where every Lagosian will feel safe to do business. So issues of security, safety, and others falls under this particular you know pillar, and that pillar has one hundred and seventeen initiatives. In total, the LSDP twenty fifty two has. 447 initiatives. And these initiatives are to be implemented by the various MDAs of government in the state. Some will be with the support of development partners, but they are to be implemented by the various MDAs in the state. And this is how it works. There will be main implementing MDA, and then there will be supporting MDAs. So, you can have initiatives, one initiative now, and you have the main MD that is implementing it, and then you can have about five or six supporting MDAs. These are MDAs whose activities, you know, may impact on the success of that initiative. They are called supporting MDAs. They're supposed to also support the main MDA in achieving or in, in successfully implementing that initiative. I think I am almost done, so I will soon leave the stage. Um, I spoke about the environmental protection sector of that uh, of the LSDB uh, 2052. It has two major focus, and each of the two focuses, uh, each of them has about 17 initiatives each. Focus number one is waste management. And it has 17 initiatives under it. The, se the second one is water and sanitation. It also has 17 initi initiatives under it. These initiatives are to be implemented by the ministry and agencies under it, but to be supported by some other, I mean, some other supporting MDAs. So I believe that these are the key things that we need to know. You know, and so what I've, I've tried to do is to summarize what we spoke about yesterday and to be able to produce a slide for all of us to have as a reference material. 
I think um, my job is done here. And if there are questions, you know, like yesterday, I, deliberately I didn't begin to mention policies that we have already in the state. I mentioned a few yesterday. I talk about the plastic waste management policy. I talk about this uh, plan. I talk about the water, sanitation and hygiene, the wash policy. And then, of course, where I, I, I dive, in, dive into uh, the the energy sector, and I talked about Lagos to electricity uh, policy and some other reforms, particularly in the transport sector. So basically, these are some of the things that I think we should just know. And then let me say lastly, before I leave, that of course, what we are doing is just to share knowledge and rub minds. Nobody, of course, know what the question uh, the examiners were going to be are going to be asking in terms of interview. But whatever they ask, you know, we should be able to, you know, put our fingers on what we do. I know there's nobody listening to me that cannot say in few words what he or she does and, and be able to relate what he, he or she is doing on a daily basis to the realization of the team's agenda and the Lagos State Development Plan 2050. We should be able to relate our activities to the realization of this major, you know, plans of government. On this note, I'd like to say thank you for your attention and your time. Good evening. God bless you.